Good afternoon, all the participants attending from institutes of repute, different uh, laboratories from the uh, urban local bodies, various city officials, and uh, scientists, and uh, other people from state boards and other agencies. I welcome you all as the coordinator of this program and as the coordinator of the National Knowledge Network. As you know, that this capacity program, capacity building program would run uh, this month, every week, twice for four hours, so basically Mondays and Thursdays. And there will be lectures given by faculty members from uh, various constituents of again, including IT Kharpur. IIT Roorkee, IIT Madras, IIT Bombay, Neeri, and as well as from iForest. So in the next two hours, I'm going to give some very basic idea as a part of this induction training on mainly four topics. These four topics include uh, giving you or uh, sensitizing you with the idea of National Clean Air Program, followed by giving you the basic idea about sustainability, then how air pollution impacts human health, climate, and our heritage buildings. And finally, that how air quality or air pollution can be monitored. So each one of these modules, which will run through about two hours, would be a 25 to 30 minutes each. And, and at the end of two hours, we'll also have some room for Q&A questions and answers. So I believe that you will all attend it uh, with full attention and take notes of it and come back to us in terms of asking questions, clarifications, and we'll make full use of it. So let me now share my slides from here. I hope all of you can see my slides. Let me just start the pointer. So, as I mentioned, I'm Sachidanan Tripathi. I'm a professor at IIT Kanpur in the Department of Civil Engineering. I'm also associated with two centers here, Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, and Keshwan Center for Energy Analysis and Climate Solutions. I'm also a member of the Steering Committee of Clean Air Program. Here's what I found. And, and also a coordinator of Western Knowledge Network, as some of you are already aware of. So let's first give some introduction about National Clean Air Program, which is also known as NCAP, many times people call it. As a short name for that is NCAP. So this program is a pan-India program, national program, and was launched by the Union Government of India on 10th January 2019. Okay. And this is a basically nation level strategy. And the lead ministry for this program is MOEF and CC, which is Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, which mainly the program is about prescribing actions for reducing air pollution in India. Recognizing the MENAS of air pollution, then Union Government launched this comprehensive, ambitious program. Comprehensive because this is the first time you have a program which is aiming to reduce air pollution at the national level. Right? Earlier programs dealing with air pollution were focused more on cities are at the most at regional scale. So this is a first 
comprehensive program at a national scale. And a lot of emphasis in this program is given on mitigation, that how do we basically remove the sources which contributes to air pollution in the different localities, cities, rural area or in the country or switch our transition to cleaner form of energy so that one can reduce the overall emissions coming from these sources. How this overall program came into being, basically it was an outcome of a participatory and collaborative approach. MOEFNCC is the lead or what we call is the main ministry, which is nodal ministry, which is leading this program, but it also involves several other important ministries, which we call line ministries, which are important stakeholder ministries. We will try to see which are those ministries which are have also important stakes in this program. In addition to that, other government agencies, for example, the central and state regulators also have an important role to play in this collaborative program. And it also relies heavily on input from research institutions, for example, IITs, universities, NITs, National Institutes of Technologies, as well as national labs, CSIR labs, ISRO labs, and other labs. In the first phase, which was launched in 2019, National Clean Air Program designated 122 cities, which are non attainment spread across 21 states and two union territories, but then additional 10 cities were added to it. So as of now, under National Clean Air Program, there are total 132 cities. non attainment by that we mean the cities where air quality does not meet the national air quality standard. Okay, whatever are the safe limits prescribed by Central Pollution Control Board, if they do not meet, we call that city as a non attainment city. Okay, that is what is mentioned here. Under what is un, un, 122 cities which did not meet under national ambient air quality monitoring program. Okay, and it is also envisioned that each city out of now 132 cities will propose a plan which is called City Action Plan. So as you know that, as a part of this capacity building overall program in this month, what we are doing, there is a specific module led by NIRI is going to focus on City Action Plans. How do we create City Action Plan? That's a very important component because depending on the type of city specific plans, actually non attainment cities will transition into attainment cities. Okay. Now, there are some other important part of this program. For example, it envisions to build institutional and technical capacity. So that means that it wants to create some new institutions. For example, you can think a new institution was created by central government in terms of uh, Commission on Air Quality, at CAQ, Commission on Air Quality Management for Delhi and CR and adjacent areas. Right? So that is kind of institution which is now put in place to protect the air quality of Delhi and NCR. Second part of that is also creating technical capacity because we understand air quality management is a highly technical subject. Realizing that 
and the need for creating capacity, the program also envisions to empower a lot of capacity in the field of a technical know-how. Okay, as we mentioned that Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution Control Board, their contrary counterparts at the state level are the custodians of air at central and national and state levels. So therefore, the program also aims to enhance their capacity to measure, evaluate, and manage air pollution. And you see all three are highly technical subjects. And that is why it aims to impart te technical capacity. It also has a very time-bound strategy that is, it wants to achieve certain goals within a prescribed time, both for the city as well as in the rural India. Of course, in the first phase, more focus is given to the cities, but subsequently, uh, we will see that the program will be extended and expanded to the rural areas as well. In the first phase, it's a five-year plan, starting with 2019, and it will be extendable to another 20 to 25 years, doing based on the reviews of interim outcomes. So let us see that some of the major sources which contribute to air pollution in our cities in addition to the natural sources. Right? Like for example, there are one or two major natural sources which come to our mind are desert dust. That if you are close to a desert, there always will be some dust which are blown by wind and can, can be carried to your city. And you have not much control of that because the natural source. Likewise, if you are close to coast, if you are in Mumbai or in Chennai or something like that, you'll find that sea also is a source of particulate matter in terms of salt, sea salt. You do not have major control on that. So those two are examples of natural sources. But then there are, we are more concerned with the man-made sources in the cities. For example, look into industrial emissions. You see that some a thick plume of pollution is coming out from this large stack. Okay, so from <coughs> excuse me. So from variety of processes which is happening in the industry, finally, after even putting some control in place, some part of the plume will come out and it will eventually will enter into the city atmosphere, which will have a variety of inorganic particulate matter, and some gases. Second example comes in mind is like biomass combustion, right? That if you are burning something indoors, many of our household you know, still do not have access to liquid petroleum gas. And they, they meet their energy needs or cooking, etc., by burning solid fuel, which also spews good amount of gases and particulate matter. There is a third source which is also quite prevalent in our cities as a road dust because of many a times that depending on the traffic condition and the quality of road, there always will be some generation of road dust which can also certainly enter into city atmosphere or because of a variety of construction or demolition activities which are going on in the cities. That also can cause basically generation or emission of dust particles in the cities. Another major source is burning of municipal solid waste. Many cities in our country still do not have a complete end-to-end waste disposal system where wastes are collected from the source, segregated, transported and finally they are put in the landfill or some other place where they are 
basically finally biodegraded so in absence of that it is a common practice that people burn the wastes and when you burn the waste wastes a variety of particulate matter and very toxic gases come out in the atmosphere which can also cause our atmosphere and our air polluted then then there is a another kind of burning which is a outcome of large scale agriculture which we have seen that that's happening in the western part of our country every year in september to november that causes great problem or harm to the air quality of entire gangetic plain where because the farms need to be cleared in a short time and therefore crops are burned in the field which causes a large amount of gases and particulate matter that come out and depending on the wind direction they then move towards the down stream side of the city so this is what is called farm or crop residue burning and finally you have emissions coming from vehicles you know that still our many of good part of our fleet in both city and countryside run on bharat 6 many of them have old engines some of them are antique vehicles and therefore if they are not well maintained and running on bharat 4 or bharat 3 then of course they also will spew huge amount of particulate matter and toxic gases and then there is another source which is not mentioned here is basically thermal power plant like in a way it's a large energy source point source which also causes emissions of particulate matter ash particles and gases and that is what you see actually leads to this kind of a very very hazy atmosphere in the city where the visibility is so poor that you cannot see these tall buildings even from a distance of few hundreds of meters or what you see that because of large amount of pollution coming from this vehicular feed which is causing also huge amount of pollution coming out and then resulting in very highly hazy atmosphere okay and this is very common sight in many places in our country so let's look at what is the timeline of this ncap national clean air program on may 17 2018 a concept note was prepared on ncap by MOEF and CC, which was discussed on June four, twenty eighteen, in a knowledge session at Vigyan Bhavan, and then in October twenty eighteen, Ministry approved the NKF document, and then finally it was basically brought into effect on January tenth, twenty nineteen. So. a very important thing is that what is the target of this program right so this program aims to reduce pm10 and pm2.5 by 20 to 30% by 2024 in 132 cities not 122 132 cities compared to the 2017 base year okay when you look at this percentage reduction we we'll try to compare with the yearly number for 2017 and as most of you know pm10 means particulate matter mass concentration having diameter less than 10 micron and pm2.5 implies particulate matter mass concentration having diameter less than 2.5 micron so what we are actually graphically looking at that what it looks in delhi at india gate in 2019 was a very murky atmosphere to relatively much cleaner atmosphere in 2024 and this program has actually three important major pillars right the first is it 
works on stringent implementation of mitigation measures. That is, it wants to bring certain policies, would recommend certain control so that pollution can either be prevented or controlled at the source, be it any type of source. The sources we discussed earlier, be it industry or power plant or uh, is a vehicular source or large scale biomass burning or municipal solid waste burning. Each of that we'll discuss as we go along. How do you do that? This will be done by augmenting and strengthening of air quality monitoring network. When the program started, we had rather a frugal network of about 180 continuous air quality monitoring stations in the country. The remaining 700 odd monitors in the country were manual in nature. Right? Manual monitors do not give you data or information at the frequency which is required to do day-to-day -day management of air quality in a city. It gives you data at the most once a day, but most of the time our manual monitoring stations give data twice or once a week only. So if you are looking at a long-term trend from such stations, that can be deciphered. But if you are trying to do some dynamic, effective interventions to manage your quality at a daily basis, then that type of data is not very useful. On the other hand, continuous air quality monitoring stations provide you data at every hour or even every 15 minutes. So that way, it is giving you data at a frequency which is very useful to understand the variation and apply the different kind of interventions to improve our air quality. But they are expensive. We'll discuss that when we'll come to the monitoring part of this <coughs> module. And a final pillar is we want to also in NCAP augment public awareness and do capacity building. As we said that, it is realized that looking at the scale of the program and the gap or the lack of capacity at all levels across the country, be it at the regulatory level or in different academic institution or at the city level. Of course, the lack of capacity and its uh, scale could be different, but in general, there is a lack of capacity and that is one of the goal of this program to build that. And that is why currently we are also doing this <clears throat> induction training program. Creating awareness in a people through larger monitoring network, of course, is a important part of it because it is thought that it has to be an inclusive program in order to ensure its success. That is the people participation would increase then the chances of this success of this program would be far more. So the approach is, as we said, is a collaborative approach at multi-scales, that is from the scale of city to state, to the central level, national level, and through coordination among sectors, because we are dealing with different type of sources, which certainly belong to different kind of economic sectors and also between different central ministries and within and with state governments. So it's a highly collaborative program in its nature and that is basically inherently part of this program. If that collaboration can be achieved, there is a larger possibility to achieve success in this program. There is also a inbuilt nature in this program is that there will be dynamic input given so that course correction can be made, program can be made more streamlined and it can be enhanced as it is on its way to 
2024. And it also aims to use the some of the framework which is currently developed by Smart City. For example, they are also developing an integrated control and command system which would basically use all type of sensors and other data to manage the transport and many other activities in effective way in smart cities. And since there will be a good overlap between some of these non attainment cities and nearby or smart cities which are being developed within that. Therefore, it's important that we leverage their framework as well. It's also envisioned that this program will be mainstreamed and integrated into existing programs. For example, Government of India has a very ambitious program of uh, national uh, mission on climate action. Okay, this is a very, a very uh, national plan for climate action. National plan for climate action is a very ambitious program to deal with the climate change in the country under which there are many missions. There are, for example, clean energy missions, solar mission, many such missions are part of the national plan for climate action. So many of those missions also could have or may have many activities which can be aligned with the activities of National Clean Air Program to, to foster the overall progress of NCAP and achieve our goals in an effective fashion. Okay, And this is what is mentioned here is that through mainstreaming, we want to accelerate the implementation. And of course, it will be a dynamic in nature and will continue to evolve. And right? it's not something which is fixed on the stone, rather it's a program which is evolving with time. Okay, As there is more learning happening, that will be fed back into it and then program will evolve. Uh, this map of India, basically gives us an idea about how different non attainment cities are spread out over entire country, right? And non attainment cities means which are not meeting national air quality standard. So what you see, there are four kind of reasons and these non attainment cities were designated based on the values of PM10 because in the manual monitoring system, only PM10 were monitored. So what you see, the green ones are those which has PM10 from 61 to 120 microgram, and all the way through, the yellow ones are the one which has highest PM10 going from 240 to 260 microgram. And what you see that below the central India in peninsula, we have relatively cleaner cities. And as we go up, most of the non attainment cities are lying in the Gangetic Plain, and some of them also are lying in Northeast India. And then there are certain cities which are, of course, in blue color close to Delhi and CR, and probably some other places where PM10 is exceedingly high, showing by this yellow, which is exceeding 240 microgram per meter cube. <clears throat> The details are basically given. I will also show the complete list of references at the end, but you can look into this document for its details. If you look into the distribution of non attainment cities across the country, the state of Maharashtra has highest number of NA cities of 18, followed by Uttar Pradesh, which has 15, and then Andhra Pradesh 13, and Punjab has nine non attainment cities. This slide gives you an idea about national ambient air quality standard. So this is basically created by after looking at data, health data, ambient air quality uh, monitoring data. Central Pollution Control Board has created that. And what you look at here, there are variety of pollutants. And some of them are called basically criteria pollutant. 
for example, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, PM10, PM2.5, ozone, carbon monoxide, and lead are called criteria pollutants, which need to be monitored at every station. Okay. And basically, there are two kind of standard which generally one uses. One is annual, another is for 24 hours. Okay. Except in some cases, for example, for ozone, for carbon monoxide, it is for eight hour and one hour. Otherwise, it is generally annual or 24 hour. And then of course, some of these kind of pollutants like benzene, benzopyrene, arsenic and nickel, it is only given in terms of annual number. So what you see, for example, very important is PM10. It has 60 microgram as a annual uh, basis and uh, sorry for 24 hour and 100 is for annual. Okay. Likewise, if you look at PM 2.5, it has 40 for annual and 60 for 24 hour. So that means on a 24 hour basis, if you are exposed to a particulate matter up to 60, then from CPCB point of view, it means that you are still breathing an air with PM 2.5, which has a uh, which is following the safe limit imposed by CPCB. And over a year, if you are breathing something which is less than 40 microgram, then it says that it is of course is a safe limit. Right. So this is for residential, rural, and industrial area. And then they also have come out with another another set of uh, you know guidelines or this criterion for ecologically sensitive area okay and for ecologically sensitive area what you see most of the numbers are similar except for sulfur dioxide and probably also for nitrogen dioxide these are because ecologically sensitive areas are you can think of like lake glaciers or biodiversity park or national reserves, national parks, where these kind of gases, if they exceed these standard or limits, they could cause some additional damage to the ecosystem of these areas through the acid rains or some other processes. And that is why what you see these numbers are relatively even smaller. If you look at sulfur dioxide, that annual number is 50, but for ecological, it is 20 microgram per meter cube. Likewise, the daily number is 80, that is same. Likewise, for NOx, it's also. So this is what is that what the all the air currently in India should meet these criteria. It is another matter that World Health Organization has actually have put a far more stringent limit for particulate matter 2.5. Currently, their limit is 15 microgram per meter cube, which is one fourth of the limit which is posed by government of uh, CPCP, which is 40 here and 50, less than one third, right? Not, not one fourth, it's about one third. Okay. Now, if you see that the, the way action plan works for this, that we want to use the expanded and extended, augmented and expanded air quality network. Once we have more air quality data, that means you have to collect data, that is measurement. Then we have to store data and archive it because only if we have a system to archive it, then one could look into the trend, one can do analytics on the data. So measurement, archival and analytics is all part of database and knowledge generation. Once we have the knowledge, then we can definitely start taking actions. Actions are basically either preventing a particular place from onset of a pollution or applying some kind of control or doing some abatement in the atmosphere. Okay, all these three 
actually forms the mitigation action. And the third is creation of as institutional strengthening. For example, the way National Knowledge Network has been created, it's basically one kind of institution which is by, created by bringing hundreds of India's technical institutions so that they can work with city officials and state boards for better implementation of clean air program. Okay, so if you see, basically the mitigation actions involve stringent enforcement, also which involves monitoring, assessment, and inspection. Extensive plantation drive. This, of course, can be leveraged through governments and other national plan for the which is a national plan for forestation. There is another important thing here is to provide technological support. And then finally, also looking into regional and transboundary. So for regional, there's already a thinking going on to create an air shed approach, right? As we all know that air pollution does not follow any political or geographical boundary, right? Because air can move from one place to another. As we have seen in the case of Delhi NCR. So a regional approach means that we have to create an area which has which follows a similar pattern in terms of air quality, and that's called air shade. And that approach has to be applied to deal with air pollution at regional scale. And when we say transboundary, that is, which is a pollution which is happening from one country to another, because we know many of the countries in South Asia are basically connected and a source located in one country, depending on the direction of wind, the pollution can be transmitted to other. So there are also some discussion which needs to be initiated and has been initiated to understand the transboundary pollution. Okay. Now let's see what are the sectoral interventions we are thinking about here. Starting with power sector emissions. So the best thing about power sector is that we want to limit the overall reliability on thermal power. This already has been announced that currently our contribution for thermal power is as high as about 60 to 70% to overall electricity generation. But by 2030, we want to reduce it to 20 to 30% by increasing the overall capacity of renewable energy like solar, wind, etc. Then comes the industrial emission, right? We know there are some industries which require complete transformation of technology like brick kiln that has been done in Delhi and CR. And many other industries either require some changes in processes or they might require a transitioning from a, from a bad fuel, dirty fuel to clean fuel. For example, many industries run on pet coke or coal or some kind of dirty oil. And as a part of their processing, and finally, what will come out will definitely have some of the uh, residues of these dirty fuel, because these won't be, have a very efficient combustion as a part of industrial process. So this also is currently happening in Delhi and CR. About 3,000 industries have been transitioned from these dirty fuel to clean fuel like LPG, etc. Then comes the transport sector emission. A large action has been taken by transitioning from Bharat 4 to Bharat 6, as you know. That is to zero sulfur, extremely, not zero, extremely low sulfur fuel is Bharat 6. And that can enable basically fitting of diesel particulate filter in these cars, which can mitigate emissions of particulate matter that comes from the exhaust of these cars. So that in that way, transport sector is uh, emissions are going to be mitigated. Other possibility is that more and more cleaner public transport is used. So in that way, individual cars which emit more pollution and they can be minimized or 
they can be discouraged. And finally, as we move to more electric vehicle, they also will contribute to lesser amount of emissions. Okay. Other major sectors are, of course, indoor, as we discussed that, large number of households still use solid fuel. So if we can connect them to LPG, we can definitely get rid of indoor, major part of indoor air pollution. If we go for integrated waste management, that is where waste is properly collected, segregated, and then brought to the landfill where they can be biodegraded. That way one could avoid burning of trash or burning of municipal solid waste in the cities, which can also definitely minimize and mitigate the pollution coming from that. And finally, of course, related to construction and demolition. This can be done by following the best practices where when such work is happening, if they can be covered properly following the best practices, then one can also avoid large amount of emissions coming from these sectors as well. Okay. <clears throat> now, as for as far as the monitoring network augmentation and database augmentations are concerned, there are plans to increase the current number of stations to 1500 stations. So as of now, there are about 320 stations, which are CA QMS, and then there are an additional few hundred, which are manual. The plan is to just make them total double, okay? So double doubling of, sorry, manual stations and making it four times are continuous air quality monitoring stations, which monitor PM 2.5, PM 10, all four important gases, that is ozone, sulfur dioxide, NOx, and carbon monoxide. And there is also a plan to set up a network in the rural India. And then there are also plans to use alternate technologies, for example, using satellite to monitor gases, because particulate matter measurement is still tricky, because there are lots of error involved here. But sensors are another important and emerging technology, which is getting now mature by doing field evaluation and that can complement and augment to monitor PM 2.5 and PM 10 at a highly resolved spatial and temporal scales. Okay. Then there is also as a part of knowledge and database, there is plan to understand the sources which contribute to ambient pollution, right? It's quite important to create a baseline information about to what extent different sources contribute to ambient PM 2.5. And that is given by source apportionment studies. And currently such studies are happening in 40 cities. And in many other non-attending cities, the plan is very much underway to start such a study. There are, of course, new and more efficient way of doing source apportionment studies have come into being, which are called real-time source apportionment. Some of them have been tried in Delhi, where you can get real-time chemical characterization of PM2.5. And then in near real time, within a few days or week, you can get the source contribution. These kind of information can definitely be used to provide dynamic input into air quality management. Then there are also plans under National Clean Air Program to understand health and economic impact of air pollution so that that can be used to, to, to expedite the activities of Clean Air Program are also provision to have international cooperation for sharing best practices and knowledge for many countries have dealt with these problems a couple of decades ago and already some collaboration and cooperation are going on with them. Then there are also plans to revisit and revise national air quality standard and also create a national emission inventory. In fact, National Knowledge Network Many partners of Knowledge Network are also working with, in, with many uh, private institutions to create a national emission inventory. Okay. Then 
there are certainly also these important points that to create public awareness and education, to impart training and capacity building, also then setting up of air information center. Now, many cities are also thinking about creating a decision support system because they are getting currently data from a variety of sources. And sometimes that data, all that data is not being used to its maximum potential. So it's important that the internal consistency of various data sets can be checked and then all can be combined through a single portal and based on that alerts etc can be issued for interventions and that kind of system one can call is a decision support system which is now getting being created by many cities and which is a very i think an important step to uh, deal with the air pollution in coming days for example if someone is have a ambient air quality monitoring or continuous emission monitoring from industries or someone is monitoring dust dust which is coming from construction or demolition waste or somebody is monitoring let's say through video images of plume now if that all can be put together then you can have a very good robust single system where all that data can be used for a variety of purposes okay now as i was telling that one institution which is created as a part of ncap is a national knowledge network which is led by it kanpur and currently there are about 100 issues of recruit as part of knowledge network which who are assigned and have a mou to work with the city where they are located or in an adjacent city on various issues of national clean air program with mutual consents. Then there are additional also institutional strengthening, which has been proposed in clean air program. For example, forecasting system, currently a very good forecasting system is created by Ministry of Earth Sciences. Definitely NCAP will be benefited from that. Then NKN is falling under this. Then there is also need to have a technological assessment set that many times some technology one has tries to uh, has many options to choose a technology. So in that case, a technology assessment cell is also required so that a technology which suits for the purpose can be chosen. Finally, you will learn in detail about these different plans of NCAP, which will be given by, led by, of course, Neri's module, that how at different level, different strategies are being carried out by different implementation agencies. You know, for example, at city, you have these kind of activities, which will be led by municipal corporation. At a state level, you have little larger high level activities, which of course falls under the purview of state, for example, solid waste management, public transport, which will be led by the state department. Then at regional level, you need interstate collaboration and sometimes many central ministries will intervene or will be a part of this coordination. And for transboundary, of course, it's the union government which will certainly uh, participate in making those rules, etc. So the way forward for clean air program is we have to have better legal mandate for reviewing and updating plans, which can dynamically feed into the clean air program. We need to intensify inspect inspections for air pollution sources. We also need to have city and state level agencies, which can be assigned with specific duties. The actions plans need to be designed as per the local need and also keeping the regional sources in mind. And then it's very important that given the national nature of this program, that the state governments also contribute from their own expenditure, from their own revenues to meet some of the clean air goals in their states. Okay. So these are <clears throat> some of the references, of course, 
you can uh, certainly be benefited by going through these references. Right? Now I will start the uh, this uh, presentation on sustainability. So this is why I'm taking that because this is a very important concept and now it is being practiced by different financial corporations, United Nations, and of course, our own government at different levels, because whatever we are dealing with climate change or air pollution, it all comes into the broad framework of sustainability. So there are these three, four points, which we are, I'm going to discuss here. First, the definition, giving a historical overview. Then what are these goals? which are called Sustainable Development Goals set by United Nations, and then how it is linked with climate change, air pollution, and health. Now, the first thing is, what is sustainability? Okay, It is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay, So to simply put it, sustainability is a study of natural systems that how they evolve, and preserve their diversity and ecological balance. In, because we all know that we live in the times of very high level of consumerism. We look at our city, we look at the uh, other part of the country or abroad. Our consumption of resources are very high. What are these resources? These resources are water, mineral, even you can say air, or even aquatic, many aquatic things, what we use, fishes. These are all our resources which we are using. And idea is that we use in a way so that our needs are met without compromising the needs of the future generation or without compromising in any way the overall state of the environment, okay? The overall environment that is water, air, sea water, land, etc. We all know that in past, because of excess, excess exploitation of resources, many civilizations have come to an end, okay? And there are many such, you can go to history and you can learn that. So therefore, it's very important that we try to create a framework which is called sustainability so that the way we do things are sustainable they can be sustained okay so what are the primary goals of sustainability certainly the first goal is to end poverty and hunger right if these two stay then of course we are not going to have a sustainable society or world then we want good standard, better standard of education and health care, health care, water quality, and sanitation for all. We also want to achieve gender equality, right? Unless we are able to give equal opportunity, equal status to both men and women, we are not able to have a sustainable society or world. We also want to have a sustainable economic growth, while promoting jobs and stronger economies. And at the same time, we want to tackle, to avoid any harmful effect of problems like global problems like climate change, major environmental problems like air pollution, and other factors which can affect people's health and, of course, can also cause damage to our planet ecosystem itself. And finally, of course, to include health of, as I said, land, air, and sea, okay? So <clears throat> what you see, basically, the sustainability actually sits on the three pillars if you want to look at in a holistic way. There's an economy, there's society, and there's environment, and sustainability cuts across these three. The first thing is economy, and then we want to create prosperity amongst people. Right? By, of course, providing enough incentives to the industries, private sectors, that they can grow, they can provide job. Of course, there can be philosophical differences 
amongst people who follow different political philosophy. But end of the day, it is important that we want to create prosperity in the societies, right? If people are prosper, then they will have better avenues for health, education, their livelihood, and for many of their other needs. Then we want to also have a society which has minimum effect of the pollution or many other things which might arise because of the large economic growth. So we need to create legislation, right? Like advanced countries have very important legislation which take care of human and other living creatures health which might get impacted due to the economic growth and the subsequent environmental degradation arising from that. And finally, we will also want to take care of the environmental degradation, right? As I said that because of economic growth, growth in population, over harnessing or exploitation of resources, we might be damaging the state of environment, be it our rivers or glaciers or our important ecosystems, our air and our land, as well as our groundwater. All of them are getting impacted in one way or another. So basically the idea is that to have a holistic approach by looking into all these three pillars. So the first thing is, of course, economic development. The idea is that we want to have development, but which is not something where it is resource intensive. For example, we know currently the energy consumption in some of our cities, city centers are very high. We want to see that in some way, can we make it in a way that the resource consumption can be reduced. Economic development happens, but without having such a high state rate of resource consumption. Okay. Second, what we said was basically societal development. That is, everyone has access to basic resources so that they can have a reasonable quality of life and decent quality of life with dignity. Right? And third is, of course, we want to also have environmental protection where we can protect ecosystems and also we can provide incentives to green technologies. Right? What are the green technologies? Technologies which mitigate or do not emit either greenhouse gases or any kind of pollution. Such technologies are called green technologies. So if you look into historical overview of sustainability, it all started with 1979, what when first World Climate Conference took place in 79. Then we have Interland Report on Sustainability in 1987. And then we had a very important, impactful meeting in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, which is called Earth Summit, where first time Agenda 21 was adopted. Then we have a meeting, Convention on Biological Diversity in 1993. Then in 1997, we have a Kyoto Protocol, which is very important one on climate change. Many of the Kyoto Protocol are still referred to and countries are trying to adhere to that. Then in 2000, UN came out with a proclamation of development goals. We'll have a slide on that. Followed by 2012, that is Rio 20 plus 20, that is 92 plus 20 in 2012 which was talked about, we talked about sustainable development. And then we have Convention of Poverty, which happened in 2021. Uh, sorry, this is first in 2021 in Paris. And then we have COP26, which just happened in Glasgow. So what you see in Paris was a landmark one. That first time it brought the climate change on the forefront where countries have to basically provide some time-bound framework for cutting the, the greenhouse gas emissions. 
and it was adopted by you see 196 countries on 12th december of 2015 and the goal was to mainly limit the global warming well below 2 degrees celsius but preferably to 1.5 degrees celsius okay because we know that if it goes beyond 2 degree then it will be very difficult to limit the global uh, greenhouse gas warming and it was also decided that many countries will have their own determined contribution rather than one one uh, overarching goal set in cop okay depending on their own context countries will decide their own climate action okay and then the important thing happened that that in order to meet or and accelerate climate actions, developed countries would support financially and also transfer the high-end technologies, that is what we call the green technologies, to developing countries. Okay, And that way, it also will spur a growth of green market and will help that our resilience to climate change and, of, of course, also adaptation to the climate change. Okay. So now what you see in Glasgow, the follow-up meeting just happened and that was a historical meeting that already a pledge of giving $100 billion been announced to deal with the climate change for developing countries and two important significant things happened. One is that US and China, two major greenhouse gas emitters reached on an agreement and second india announced that it would reach it would re, it would become totally carbon neutral by 2070 which means that carbon neutral implies that that the amount of carbon which is emitted through all the sources that similar amount of carbon will be taken away from the atmosphere Okay, so the net carbon which is going into the atmosphere from all actions, all economic actions or otherwise in India will be zero. Okay, so this is what you see basically are the 17 sustainable development goals. The details of that, of course, you can read out. And these goals basically touch every part of human life. But there are two or three goals which are important from air pollution point of view. One is good health and well-being, you see, because air pollution affects human health. Then second is, of course, sustainable cities and communities because it is related to cities. And then there is also a climate action and life on land. These are, you can say, four SDGs, which are basically three, number three, number 11, number 13, and number 15 are the ones which are directly connected with the air pollution. Now, if you see one important thing, which is called the food, energy, and water nexus, which has a direct bearing on basically either understanding sustainability or doing sustainability analysis of a system. For example, if you look at water, okay, through water you can see if there are deposition of black carbon on glacier, glacier can melt or it can become polluted. And this is happening because of emissions of particulate matter from variety of sources or through the ozone, through the crop production. You also can have emissions of greenhouse gases because crop after harvesting is transported and then there are gases like ozone which can reduce crop yield. It's well, very well known. So you see there is a nexus here as well. And third is of course from energy sector you can have various emissions which can also cause the reduced efficiencies of our solar system. So you see all three have linkages amongst themselves and they also are linked to other okay so this way 
you see air quality and climate change are integral to the water energy food nexus and this i think is very clear by looking at this slide if you look at this slide here are the natural systems like you are doing mining then here is a basically a industrial system or industrial complex so you are having electricity petroleum and then you have city here where you have urban metabolism like whatever activities are happening at a urban scale which is also you can call urban ecology so what you see we call it as a city porous boundary and then what you see these are basically happening at a cross scale infrastructure from urban to industrial complexes to the mining or the places where you extract resources from okay right and who are the people who are involved here you see these are social systems so you see infrastructure designer and operator work at this scale and then at the urban scale there are individual users which operate at the home scale and these social systems can operate as cross scale institutions or it can go up to the global scale right so you see there is a very strong interaction going on across the scales and also through a variety of social actions so what you see notice here on the home scale your indoor pollution your urban heat island at the urban scale then you have regional air pollution and then you have global climate change correct and if you look at the institutions we deal with that at the home level you have basically people who use for their energy need then you have neighborhood which uses solar panel etc which can deal with this urban heat island then you have city codes city guidelines that what kind of building should be used and then as you move further and further then you can come to the intergovernmental rules which can deal with the clean air and can also cap and trade scales for carbon okay so this one what actually gives you a very uh, kind of a succinct idea that how one can develop such kind of a framework for understanding a particular system and systems adjacent to it to do a sustainability analysis a system based sustainability analysis right which again is quite clear from this diagram here you see this diagram shows that you have social actors you have sustainable infrastructure strategist you have city sustainability matrices right so the social actors will give idea about the behavior policies which should enter into the design of urban uh, locality sustainable production sustainable consumption and outcome of that will be more sustainable cities correct which is directly linked with the industrial ecology infrastructure through the engineering and architecture and then of course these things will come out from the theories coming out from social behavioral and policy sciences so what you see that here you have a very broad based interdisciplinary integration and here what is going on that the feedbacks amongst different kind of actors right so we will stop it here now and we will continue for the next two modules that is basically dealing with the monitoring and the impact on human health crop climate and monumental heritage okay and i am looking forward after that a lots of interaction during question and answer sessions thank you